shelter remain poor families.
you know, sometimes it was related to the very high number of Egyptian migrants um, in Libya at, you know, at that time. Um, although this, you know, in their, uh, this is at least what some respondents um, explained. They related it to the, you know, the high numbers of uh, Egyptian migrants uh, at the time. I'm just also wondering, um, this uh, Egyptian migrant which you had uh, focused on, um, which area in Libya have they been working in? Because I think you, you should really know that from the beginning, even before the revolution, not all areas in Libya treat uh, foreign workers the same. So in some areas, they are much more hostile than others. Um, I myself, I am from Tripoli, and I think in Tripoli, I don't want to defend anything, but in Tripoli, it's much less uh, this kind of practices against any migrants than in other areas. Also, it depends uh, of the, not the type of employment, but the people who they work for. And um, this discrimination happens not only, I don't want to defend anything, don't misunderstand me, but um, this happens against even youngsters from wherever they come from, even if they are Libyans. So uh, the situation is very hostile in Libya, and it's bad, it's had been for years now. But it just, I think the momentum, uh, you know, got so uh, hot, you know, in, the, in a way or another, uh, towards the revolution. So uh, does these workers, you know, who you have, uh, evidence or interviewed um, have um, spoken or said differently if they come of if they are working in say the east, west, south, Masrata or whatever or not. Yes, I have uh, two uh, very good questions. Uh, one, uh, first about uh, do you have an estimate of how many Egyptians are still in Libya? Um, um, and also, uh, you mentioned that uh, some of the Lebanese or migrants they said that it's very uh, dangerous to go back to uh, Libya. Uh, do you know, like, uh, do you have like, a number or, uh, or like an approximate percentage of how many of the Lebanese went back uh, to Libya in during the last uh, five years since 2011? And what are the motives, whether it's uh, socially or economically or whatever, uh, kind of going back again? Uh, also, I have another question about why uh, why these uh, three main uh, cities or governments? Like, I mean, what are the uh, main reasons? Uh, whether it's uh, economically, but they're, they're poor, they like you know, infrastructure, they like uh, have high uh, rate of uh, uh, illiteracy. You know, but or, what, why why there's so many people from so high in you know, Libya and they of going to Libya? Uh, my question is uh, to you, uh, it's uh, concerning the study in Lebanon. Uh, you said that uh, <coughs> the study was uh, uh, during 2006. Did you do the study during then? And what was the main focus of that study? Thank you. Did any of the studies come up with uh, policy recommendations regarding the international legal framework and whether we need an international legal framework specifically for migrants coming out from crisis group? Thank you. I might not have accurate answers to all questions, but uh, on the first question by uh, Mr. Razek, uh, definitely, I mean, there was a consensus that. In general, uh, Egyptians are not so much favored, but the degree of violence was frequently, as we explained in the presentation, 
very much visible after 2011, and it was mainly charged because of, I mean, what one would mention that when Zayt al-Islam came out and said that Egyptians told Libyan the revolution, for example, or there's one Egyptian who bombed, uh, you know, who, who, who's being uh, charged for, for bombing a certain area. This is this were the time where uh, Egyptians were targeted. No, is absolutely correct, but I need to get back to uh, data. There were some areas where they uh, thought that they had uh, long ties with Egyptian, um, and, and Tripoli was one of them. Um, I think the and third were often uh, questionable, but I really, I mean, I have to get back to my data. In terms of statistics, I'm very sorry, I can't, I don't have an answer for this because even the ministerial, the ministerial entities that we aim to interview, they they said. These are people who are not registered with the ministry. They are they have entered irregularly, and that's why it is very hard to keep track of the numbers. The motives now are mainly economic, and they uh, kind of consult with each other. The predecessors who go there, how is this, how is the situation there? Because they have been used to a certain pattern of consumption, and they have lots of remittances, even debts for uh, the return journey that they are striving to pay back. And that's why it's mainly an economic. Um, one of our stakeholders mentioned that there are opportunities, but these people don't want to use them uh, because they have been used to getting um, lucrative or um, profitable uh, kind of professions rather than here getting a less amount for seasonal agriculture, for example. Um, on why these particular uh, governments, uh, they were mainly governments that. Uh, I mean, A, there was, there was sort of a social analysis. I'm not sure if it was quite a accurate. Uh, one of a couple of our respondents said that in Upper Egypt, you have more commitments towards your extended family than the than, uh, you know, folks. Uh, so you have to marry off a sister or a brother. Uh, they also all complained of the uh, seasonal, like I said, the seasonal agriculture. So they basically work 15 or 30 days a year. Um, they mentioned that in Delta there are other businesses like textiles, etc., and the lack of skills. And basically, we're talking about people who don't have skills. So, I mean, the only thing they can do is daily labor, which is seasonal. Thanks for your question. I, I have to apologize for not having given the framework of the, the timeline of the, the research. Um, the project at large began in 2015, um, spring 2015. The research began, the field work research started at the start of 2016 for all six case studies. Um, and the reason for that is also because, the reason why we've chosen the, the field work and the, the, the time of the crises are related to the fact that that's the, the objective of our research is to look at long-term consequences. So the research was not conducted in 2006, but it was on the impact of the 2006 crisis. However, Lebanon is dealing with um, a number of other significant issues at the moment, uh, which is why it also is looking at the broader situation of migrant domestic workers. Um, we included in that study also interviews with Syrian domestic workers um, to see whether, because we had anecdotal evidence uh, that they were entering the domestic work sector. Um, so we wanted to interview some to see whether this is the case, and we included that in our questions with other migrant domestic workers as well. Um, the, the, the research is, is anecdotal, like also our, our research and more would be needed to, to further look into that. Um, but our overarching focus was on how, uh, because, because there wasn't much long-term uh, policy learning, of from the 2006 crisis, how uh, migrants themselves and CSOs have all responded that for them it's not about the 2006 crisis, it's that not even CSOs, authorities that we interviewed said Lebanon is a country of crisis. We're always in crisis. There's always a crisis. <laughs> Several authority interviews said that. So, and at the same time, domestic workers themselves also said we're in constant crisis. There's not like 2006, okay, I went to the mountains and I was fine, or somebody had to leave. There were extreme cases, of course, but what has come out of this particular research, because it is a bit aside from the other case studies, was that um, it's a continuous thing. Um, yes, I don't, I don't know if that... Yeah, you, you pointed at the one, the one case study that's a bit aside from the others, but there's a particular reason for that. Uh, I can discuss further if you're interested. Um, in terms of recommendations, um, 
the, the report that I provided before and that I was presenting from it does not present recommendations because the research is not finished. Um, so we are currently in the process of finalizing case studies and we do want to include recommendations of course in them. Um, from the guidelines from, that were released in the context of the, in the framework of the MAKIC initiative, I don't think that they, I am not able to speak precisely on that, I, did, I wasn't involved in drafting it anyway, but I don't think that they in any way recommend a new framework. I think it's more about um, applying the frameworks that we have now, and, and yeah, it's mostly on better applying what we have now, uh, and it's according to a few, six principles, they have six principles that they're following, and along those in these guidelines, how you can better respond to migrants, and it's about using what you already have, basically. Do we have more questions? Okay, so if you don't have more questions, I'll just have very short questions. <laughs> I just want to make it, it's not clear for me why refugees are not included in the framework. And for Sarah and Mohammed, I just want to make sure that um, the Egyptian mi uh, migrants, they are, they're not long-term migrants, they are more circular migrants. So they, are, they, come, they keep on coming and going. You haven't met anyone who has been there for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing, there was uh, just, uh, you said, you, you're talking as if they mostly go through Tunisia. This is not the case, right? Uh, I mean, return to Tunisia. Is it the case? So just the other group. Concerning refugees, um, this is a, a decision of the wider initiative um, because refugees are covered by the Geneva Convention and there's an, uh, the, the UNH, uh, UNHCR is mandated with their protection. Um, this is about um, de jure, not de facto. So, of course, in, in reality, there are important issues about, about refugees causing crises. And we have tried in this research to include them when we can. So in Tunisia, we're looking at stranded migrants, which includes refugees secondarily displaced. In um, Cote d'Ivoire, we also look at Liberians who are who were refugees in Cote d'Ivoire and then returned to Liberia. Um, so we've tried to, in, uh, I think also, um, South Africa touches on some of these issues as well regarding uh, Zimbabweans. Um, but that's um, that's that's the, the simple thing. So basically, because there is an organization which is the UNHCR, that has an update. Yes, there's a there's an international framework in place. It's but the international. That's the second part. I totally, I definitely understand what you're get coming where you're coming from. But um, the fact was that there is no international framework and a mandated entity. There was not, let's say, at the time of all these crises. Um, I one has now, uh, I mean, with the with the UN General Assembly and their their folding into the UN framework, maybe this will change. Um, but at the time of, of for example, particularly the 2011 crisis, the international community came together and said there is a gap in the protection framework for migrants caught in a crisis situation. There is a framework for refugees. There's a second question of whether that's implemented, but there is already something there. That's. Okay, on the circular migration, the, I think the longest we've met was who will spend time between five to six years. However, the, the reason why they keep coming and going is that, uh, I mean, they, A, because of the proximity, and also once they feel that they have enough money, they go back and then they think they still need to, have more profit or have more income, so they uh, return to Libya. Um, they also keep constantly checking the security, so it's, it's mainly a security decision to leave it, not, not necessarily that they have had enough money. So many of them, the, the, the first return was in 2011, before they were married visits, so they returned and they resumed the work. But then ever since 2011, the decision is always how insecure or secure the condition is. 
On the return from Tunisia, many of them, I mean, the majority, attempted to go directly from Egypt to, from Libya to Tunisia, but they call it a dead layo. And they, once they, they were stopped at the checkpoint, and they turned again. So Tunisia seemed like a more accessible route, especially those of 2011, to try from Tunisia, and then they were taken by air. So they, their early attempt was to go directly, but they failed because of checkpoints and violence and being returned back and forth to Libya. Thank you very much for the three speakers and thank you for for everyone for coming to CMRS. We hope to see you again next month. We will send you an email uh, about the topic and the speaker closer to the day. Thank you again. Bye.